ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting episode of Two Guys and Some Horror. On tonight's episode, Clark tries to get Curtis to wear the glasses for 30 minutes until he reluctantly agrees. We're doing They Live. Yes! How you doing tonight, Curtis? Oh, uh, can I just put the glasses on now and we get it over with? I mean, no, that's not how the movie works. Shit, you're right. You gotta, we gotta have like a 30 minute long fight scene. Which is one of the best fight scenes, I think, in all of television film do history. You, do you really think that? That's what a lot of people say. It was it was the most realistic fight scene I've seen in a movie. It was. They, uh, I mean, yeah, we'll get there. But yes, I, I agree 100%. I think, it's, I think it was a lot of fun. Um, cool. So let's, let's just get well, into... We're, we're in it. Yeah. How are we're, you, how you doing? Talking. Doing great, man. I'm uh, doing pretty great. I, I just... Uh, well, I guess do we want to start with the, the quick review right now, or how do you want to how do you want to move this forward? Because this this movie is an episode of the Twilight Zone. Um, it's I feel that it's longer than it should be. I, I don't know. I think John Carpenter kind of put a lot of padding in the film here and there. It could have used a lot more, but solid movie, just a little bit too drawn out. Yeah, I think there's a lot of parts of the film that we could cut out, trim it down. But I mean, it only had a runtime of an hour and thirty-seven minutes. Mm. You trim them, you trim enough out of it, and it becomes now it's like a trauma film. You know what I mean? An hour and seventeen, and you end up with something that doesn't really get called cinema. It, it gets a different label and a different tag, and that's not really um, Carpenter's shtick. So I think yeah. that filler is almost needed for him. Speaking of a five-minute fight scene, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you know, you cut that down to a standard 35-second, minute-and-a-half fight scene, you're already cutting your movie now into a close to a low 130. Who knows what could happen? Um, but so, no, I, I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of filler. I think there's a lot of still unexplained things, though, too, that we don't get a uh, final explanation on. I feel like, uh, so as the movies, we actually have the movie on going on in the background, too. Like, the... The scene going on right now is where one of the characters discovers like an underground rebel base for what we'll get into. Uh, I kind of wish there was more exposition on other characters. I wish there was more exposition on the heroine of the film or whatnot. Because Meg Foster, I whatever. Because uh, I don't, I don't know what her role was in this movie. Yeah, she didn't. So I don't, I don't really feel like they they touched on any romance with between her and Nada. Oh, what was her name? Holly. Holly. Holly, Holly and Nada. And, uh, yeah, no, some of the things didn't really connect or fit together. Otherwise, decent film. I feel that what this movie tries to to express is the more important part rather than the plot itself. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a political speak from John Carpenter himself, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I We were talking about this right before we hit the record button, but I've watched a lot of uh, interviews and... Um, I don't know what to call them, live discussion panels with Roddy Piper and Keith David, um, interviews one-on-one -on -one with John Carpenter and other folks, and he's just always been very adamant about um, talking about the Reaganomics behind why, you know, what he was trying to portray and what he was trying to do back in 1988, which I think maybe, to your point we were talking before also, it hits a little bit better today than it did back then even. Right. Um but yeah, so socioeconomic conversation aside, housing crisis, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, wages not going up, uh, trickle down economics, consumerism not working, consumerism is a big one. It's yeah, with Instagram today, yeah, especially with influencers trying to get you buy the things that are completely useless information. It's being hard to get actually real information. Snake oil becoming more rampant. So the snake oil one's the most I think prevalent a lot of times nowadays. Yeah. Everybody wants a solution that's quick and it's easy and they don't have to do anything for it. They'll pay probably just about anything to get it. And a lot of the time they'll believe it's working because of the placebo effect. Yeah. So you got to be careful out there, folks. Don't buy from goop. Goop. Um, but <laughs> calling you out. Let's get, let's get back on track for the movie. Um, I'll run through the quick stuff that we do normally. Yep. So this is our final week of John Carpenter. Mm -hmm. um, we focused on him for the entire month of February besides Valentine's. Uh, they Live is the final film that we're doing for him. 1988 was its release date. Director's obviously John Carpenter. The writers were, uh, it's based on a short story by Ray Nelson, um, but John Carpenter wrote the screenplay under the name of... Wasn't it a comic book? Uh, 
short story is what it gets listed as, but it was a visually based comic book, which we'll link in the description because it was awesome. Um, Frank Armitage. How would you pronounce that? Frank Armitage. Armitage. uh, He's a character in the movie, too. Uh, That's who Keith David plays. So that guy doesn't exist, and that's just a pseudonym. It's just a pseudonym. The budget was three million, and it made thirteen Four million, million. Actually, uh, there's a, debate there. Yeah, there's a debate there. There's What's, a debate there. IMDb lied to us. IMDb, I believe, has it listed at four. Yeah. When John Carpenter told whoever I was watching, she said he said three. So who knows? I would trust IMDb over John. John's probably Fair enough. off the top of his head. <laughs> Fair enough. It says estimated. Uh, but opening weekend, it only made um, like four point eight million, but it, the gross, like you said, is about thirteen. 13 million. So. Pretty that's good. Not, that's not bad for a John Carpenter film. No. Especially after you look at some of his uh, other movies like The Thing or Halloween that got pretty good reviews and, and brought in quite a bit of money as well when they hit the box office. Anything um, later, though, that he's done has more that, or less flopped. I would say plateaued. Uh, I would say Vampires <laughs> is the only movie that plateaued. Oh. The rest after that what a, kind of flops. It's a great movie. Last week, if yeah. you guys didn't listen, Vampires with our guest speaker, Mimic, it was a lot of fun. That was a great episode. Give it a listen. Um, but yeah, the body count was 59 bodies. That's what I counted. Yeah, most of them were killed by Nada. <laughs> yeah, uh, and they were also in the last seven minutes of the movie. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of bank scene as well. You get a good chunk of that. You get a good chunk. Jeez. Well, let's get into it. Let's let's talk about it. let's talk about the beginning. So the main Rowdy character... Rowdy Piper. Rowdy Roddy Piper plays George Nada. Uh, he was. Based off that character in that short story or the the graphic novel, he's essentially a homeless person. He's kind of walking through town looking for work, and the the first part of the movie shows kind of the hardships of what it's like to be struggling and looking for work, being part of like the lower class. And during the nineteen eighties, during uh, Reagan and Nancy Reagan, and it was a it was a hard time, especially in I think New York City. I, I remember the eighties was kind of seen as like the dark ages for new york and apparently like rudy giuliani or something like political political, politics aside like a lot of things got fixed but during this period there was a lot of uh transient workers especially uh i would i would have to lean on you for that because even in history like in school we don't you don't you don't talk about that no they don't talk about it um but i know from from at least from my father's perspective so i was born in 89 Mm-hmm. Um, my dad was 21, I think, when he had me, um, and my grandfather was an iron worker or a, um, a miner. Right. And he was it was basically transient work. It was they wound up in a city, a small city. They found jobs. They worked, you know, day in, day out, all night. Sometimes didn't see family for you know weeks at a time, and that was through 70s and the 80s for sure. It's changed since then. A lot of the mines have been closed down. Uh, Bisbee's like was like the big was a big place for uh, here in Arizona there we have the Queen Copper Mine there it was like the number one source of copper here in the United States for quite a while or to my knowledge at least until that got closed down so you'd assume that especially during this time when our steel mills are getting closed down because uh, J- Japan's producing better steel than us uh, things like that this make it, it just makes a lot of sense yeah so he he finds work as a construction worker uh, working with uh, another guy Kind of helps him find the job. I believe Frank Armitage is his name, as we talked about earlier. Or Frank. Frank. They haven't listed as Frank. I've heard him called Frank Clark. Yeah. And uh, the first time I've heard him called Frank Armitage, you just mentioned it. It makes more. It makes sense. So it's Frank. We know that. Um, they I don't do a lot of Frank. story behind the characters. You know what I mean? Like oh. we we're talking about exposition on characters. Well, all we know from from Rowdy Roddy Piper's character Nada is that. A, he believes in working for the sweat of his brow, and he just keeps his head down. That's that's how he kind of introduces himself. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Frank's kind of, he's got like a wife and three kids or something. That's all Back in really Michigan? Know. Yeah, back in Michigan, and he's like getting money for them, working as hard Hasn't as he can. Hasn't seen him in however long, he says. It's a while. Yeah, so, well, Frank kind of points out to uh, Nada, he says... Or he tells him of this shelter, and Nada doesn't say anything back, and Nada just kind of follows him back to the shelter. There's some back and forth quips between the two, and Nada becomes part of this uh, little community. Yeah, so it's it's a looks like a squatter's pit. Um, I mean, it's in California. They're it's definitely, a Hooverville. 
Yeah, um, we're, we're actually seeing it right now. It's it's a shanty town. Yeah, and and th- this is a little society, a little a little you know family, a little village, and they all they all pitch in, they help each other. They, you know, the minute that Nada shows up, the main guy who runs the place, um, he's already talking to him like, "Hey, what's in the bag? What do you got in the bag?" And Nada's like, "Oh, it's just my tools," kind of a thing. And he's like, "Perfect, we can use tools." You know, the 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 showers are broken right off the bat. He's already like looking at how how can Nada make an impact into their little their little village, right? Um, it's, it's very interesting, um, from my perspective, because Nada is that kind of guy who's just, he's trying to find his way in the world. Mm -hmm. I wrote it down as like, it's very, the opening was super Western to me. John Carpenter is infamous for wanting to make that Western. Mm -hmm. This was, I think his first secret attempt at it because the opening of the movie, I'm not saying a full Western, no, but it had that twangy music. Mm-hmm. It had that lone gunman kind of coming into town feel. Rough and gruff. Man yeah, and I, I thought it was a really cool, like, if he didn't get to do his Western, he could at least be happy he got to do that. Right. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> anyway, well, it's, it's, this is just my crazy brain. No, that's that's fine. I, I, I get it. I understand. That. When you said that, I kind of was like, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. The, the only thing is, like, it's really hard to turn a lot of this into a western because of the broadcast portion of the film yeah there's but, too much technology involved uh even then essentially there's you know there's all this kind of like there's there's tv on all the time they show they showcase quite a bit of it like all these advertisements you see the main character Nada watching tv and then at one point in this this town they live in they get their broadcast interrupted in this scientist starts talking is telling him what you're seeing is not real we, we've hacked into their signal and he's talking about a bunch of things and everybody's like that's crazy this is all a bunch of bs um and i was like i, I don't know what to think uh, that's kind of what i what i got from him he, he's it's almost like he's just paying attention to what's happening around him and soaking in information right he's not quick to action he's no. very um, he, he's very methodical about what he decides to do and not do until like cool. halfway through the film. But, but there's a reason we'll get he, there. Well, he finds like, he goes to the church that's right next to the mm-hmm. place and he finds like a box full of sunglasses. Uh, he apparently gets taken in there and there's some people that he, he's met in a shanty town who are members of this, mm-hmm. this underground facility. And he's like, He's like he gets kind of creeped out by it, so he leaves. It's got a very cultist vibe to it. It does, it does, and it's like an. Well, from what I saw, it was a very much like an underground rebellion. And the one guy at, in the front's like, "Oh, you'll be back, you'll be back." And it's just, hmm. but but uh, you know, the night goes on. He discovers it's a fake choir group singing. You know. Um, He does discover the sunglasses. There's a big giant mural written on the wall. They live, we sleep in plain, you know, text that we all can see. Um, And that night, Nada's kind of watching the church because it's pretty late. They're out there working. um, You know, the the church is cooking, I think is what the, 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 the main guy said. And, and, uh, and, and they get attacked. Basically a SWAT team shows up. Swarms the church, kicks everybody out, and they start being the shit out of all the They start beating the shit out of everybody. There it's, is so much police brutality. In it's this. it's essentially a 1980s police <clears throat> raid when they went into the homeless places and yeah, it, and it, would well, kick this them is out. A political, this definitely is a political statement. Uh, I forgot to mention the guy who kind of talks to him is blind and he's like touching his face. He's like, mm-hmm. "Oh, I can see. You're not one of them." <laughs> yeah, because so. oh my god, it's so good because. At this point, as a as a watcher, you still don't know what what they're talking about. Yeah, and I, which I would appreciate not understanding the first half of this movie because mm-hmm. in the very beginning, you kind of think, okay, so this is a movie about the lower class and the upper class, without knowing that this is somewhat a science fiction movie. So after this raid, it's everybody gets a good sleep. Uh, Nada kind of saves a couple people, puts them aside, and he takes a box of these sunglasses from the church, and he takes a pair for himself, wears it, and that's where all the insanity begins. Because as soon as he puts puts on these sunglasses, he turns into a total dick. 
Yeah, it's it's and this is where I was saying I personally I think the glasses have some kind of effect. Like he mentions right. that he gets a high, you said earlier, right? It's it's because they uh so apparently they they block out this radio broadcast that is making the aliens see what they want us to see or how well, there are, there are aliens in this film. Spoiler, guys. But uh, we were getting there anyways. <laughs> anyhow, he puts on these sunglasses and all the subliminal messages within advertisements. He sees them automatically. Yeah. This is the social commentary in the film. You see an ad, and it's like, uh, what is was it? Procreate. Sleep. Procreate. Uh, don't think. Yeah, don't think. Um, those are really, I think, the three main things that you keep seeing over and over again as it goes. They just they want you to stay complacent and they want you to just go with the flow. Don't question authority. Just do your job. And the better that you do that, the more you get rewarded, we find out as well. Mm. Um, those who just conform become rich elitists and basically get to live off the backs of everybody else below. We're talking about, we're getting a little ahead, but yeah, that's that's a lot of it. And we see the guy, He so not, not just putting on the glasses, and he's getting like a little, it's kind of like a rush to his brain, so he's yeah. essentially getting high when he's wearing them, which we'll talk about that going on. Uh, right now he's seeing Obey. Uh, he goes, he eventually, he, he's at like a newspaper booth, and he's reading the newspaper, and all the ads are showing him specific words, <clears throat> and this old guy's about to buy a paper. And he looks at his face, and it's like all skeletal and weird and creepy looking. And Which I think is amazing. He um, just keeps looking at him. It's the same guy. They use the same guy for most of those alien shots. For the face, for the dude. Yeah. Um, they they didn't want to go and make a bunch of different type of masks or whatnot. So they had one guy, and then they just placed him in a lot of the, the same shots over and over again, duplicated. Mm. Um, and they, they showed his actual hands, though. His hands weren't skeletal at all. No. scene. Which, if you look at any other scene when there's an alien or something like that, you see their their hands are kind of like a little goofy. A little goof. So it was a little, yeah, a little goof <laughs> up on their part right there. Oh, yeah, no independent thoughts. Do not question authority. So they had, um, you know, after he sees all these signs, he's kind of, he's tripping balls at this point. Yeah. He's, he's high on understanding and basically heads... Anywhere he can to try and figure out what the heck is going on. He heads to that grocery store. He calls the lady ugly, and you see people looking at their watches. They're talking in their watches, and they're saying things. He can see. He can see. And everyone's kind of huddling up on him. So he freaks out. He leaves. He goes, hold on. One of, his, one of the quotes I think is so good. He's like, you? You're okay. This one is fucking ugly. I take these off, and everyone looks normal. I put them on, and she looks like her head was dipped in formaldehyde. So good. Rowdy, his overacting is top-notch, man. Top-notch. He's doing his... I, I think that's just him in general as a person. He's... I don't know. I, I feel bad about Rowdy Rowdy Paper, but we could talk about that another time. We, like the crap we are going to get... wrestlers go on with the WWF, yeah. like or WWE, sorry, WWE. They don't treat their wrestlers right. They don't take care of them. They're a bunch of jerks. It's, it's very similar, but we could talk about that. Maybe uh, we should have a podcast just about wrestling. Oh no, man! I I couldn't. You should get a a big wrestler. Anybody who loves wrestling, if you want to talk about wrestling sometime, feel free. <laughs> Reach out to us. We'll do a bonus episode just on wrestling for funsies. I I don't know enough to to really give an opinion. You know what, Clark? I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. I'm all out of gum. Yeah, that happens. So after he leaves the store, two policemen accost Nada. And they get into like this little kerfuffle. And he beats the shit out of these two police officers and takes their shotgun. He gets to clothesline the shit out of that guy. So yeah. good. Well, he goes into the bank and he pew pews like all of the aliens. He just kills them all. And then he leaves. And he's in hiding for a good portion of the movie. But how he gets out is he finds Holly. She's not one mm -hmm. of them. And he makes her drive him to her place. This is where I start to lose understanding. Yeah. I'm just being totally honest and frank. As soon, <laughs> frank. As soon as Nada meets Holly, I don't understand her role. I don't know what she's supposed to be in this movie because it never fully gets explained. It feels like they shoehorned her in. It feels like they needed a female lead and they threw her in there. 
She, I, I don't think there is any reason for her to be in the film. Uh, if if there was some sort of this is my ex wife, right, or some sort of connection in the beforehand, that makes more sense to me. But at this point, he's her captor. He forces her to take him home. He rests. She, she kicks, kicks his him, ass out. She kicks him, throws him out the window, essentially. <laughs> and then he sees her again later. And then all of a sudden... But it's like, like they're best friends at that point. No, nah, and she's like, oh, I'm in love with you now type yeah. type thing. And I'm just like, this is stupid. It doesn't make sense. Well, he's got it. He's thinking with his dick at that point, which I don't get. It doesn't make sense to me. She... Yeah, no. I figured with the glasses on, I would have been his cautious. dick wouldn't work anymore. I would have been cautious with her right off the bat, but since she's an attractive female. Well, and then, okay, so I don't want to fast forward too far, but then yeah, they get yeah. raided. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's... There's obviously a traitor in the midst, but beyond Let's get back that, on track. Beyond that, she calls the police and... The real police. The Sure. <laughs> the real police. We don't know. All the police. Um, So Frank, or, or Nada, he's... He's he's on a limb. He meets Frank, and Frank's like, Here, here's your money. He gives him the money. He's like, put on the glasses. He gives him a pair of sunglasses he found in a dumpster that he had to go searching for. Mm-hmm. And they fight for 30 minutes. And it's just Nada trying to force Frank to wear the glasses. It is, gets, it is so fun to hear these two talk about this fight scene. So, uh, Rowdy... Uh, Rowdy Piper and Keith David um, absolutely love talking about this fight scene. They will they will talk about it for hours. So let me just kind of summarize the 15-minute panel talk that I watched him talk about. Basically, Keith David, uh, the way he tells it is Rowdy let him do whatever he wanted, and Rowdy took all those hits like a true wrestler would. There's, you know, there's terms for all the the fighting and wrestling and whatnot for when you're going to take a real hit and when you're not. Um, and basically Rowdy was like, just do it, man. Just wail on me. Go after it. Um, when Keith gets up and walks out of the live panel, Rowdy then turns and goes, is he gone? Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, he's gone. He's like, that motherfucker hit so hard <laughs> and he thinks he's going easy on you and he thinks he's hitting you soft. Like he basically just lets him have it. He's like, He is, Keith is the best fighter I've ever come against. He will tell you day in and day out that that he was holding back. But I swear to God, man, if that guy hit me one more time, I was going to deck him. (laughs) He's like, John just told us to keep rolling, keep going. We, I mean, we, he wanted to have the longest fight scene you've ever seen. Oh man, it was, it's, I would look it up if, uh, if you guys want to see it. It's a really fun panel with them. And, uh, yeah, anyways, I, felt that fight scene and i hate to be the contrarian here i felt it had no place in the film i it didn't john just <laughs> wanted a five minute he wanted the longest fight scene in film history that's see, exactly you see guys what he said actually hit each other that's mm-hmm. essentially what you're saying yeah. and you see guys like throw on boxes and nada wins the fight and yes. forces the glasses on frank and frank now sees the aliens then nada says partner life's a bitch and this one's in heat. So the two of them are now partners in crime. They are now the two rebels versus the world. And they check into like this shitty hotel and Can I get a room? Like it's just the way they walk in, they look so defeated, both of them. Yeah. They uh Roddy's got like, you know, his whole face is bruised and beaten. Um, and they're in the room, they're arguing. Yeah, he's like, tell me, tell me, what does he say? Why are, why are they here? Where did they come from? So Frank's asking all these questions to Nada, and Nada's just like, I don't know, man. Like, if I had the answers, I'd tell you, but I don't have the answers. They're See just all the flying saucers and shit, and Frank's freaking out. And Well, they, they find out that there's, after this point, when they're, all, they're both, like, kind of getting high off the glasses, he says... They, they learn that there's a meeting at a community center. Mm-hmm. They go to the meeting. Well, yeah, the boss the boss from the, the the shanty town, Peter, shows up, Peter, and he tells him, he's like, hey, you know, there's a meeting tonight at whatever time, come. Well, he knew that they were on to him. Yeah. He knew that he, he was fine with it. and Yeah, he follows him. Yeah, yeah. He, he's a smart dude. They, they, man. I feel like they had a lot of, like, um, they had a lot of traction. And then Rowdy shows up does the bank thing and I think kind of actually put their plans 
back. You know what I mean? Like pulled them back a little. I think he just went crazy. Uh, yeah, Peter sees them in the hotel and then kind of starts talking to them and sees them with the sunglasses. They're all best friends now. Meet Holly. Holly's back. She's in the meeting for whatever reason. They're talking and she's like, I hope I didn't hurt you. I thought I killed you. And he said, yeah, I did too. And they had their moment, which... I felt... I feel like Holly was still a double agent at that time. No, I didn't trust her at all. Yeah. I didn't trust her at all. And I don't know. I, Not I, one bit. No. No. Bit. Having seen too many movies, knowing that there's usually a, a betrayal at some point that most scripts have, it, like especially with movies like this, she was the one that like if somebody's going to betray, if, if they're going to get raided, she's going to be the reason. She disappears Nada looks for her. He can't find her. He knows she works at this broadcast company, the mm -hmm. one they're going to raid. Um, she mentions that, uh, that she works in broadcasting. I don't know if it was that right facility, but they go there. and They, they use the, the watch to, to teleport. To teleport there. Dude, that was so cool. Yeah. And the, well, the plan was <clears throat> for them to like disable the signal mm -hmm. and they were going to find it. And so who is it? Their, their boss, their, their construction boss or something? That does what? Who's uh, so when they're at that that swanky party, so they end up at a swanky party. There. No, it's one of the old bums. It's one of it's the one old, of the old bums. bums from the shanty town who got rich off the backs. That of was everyone the one else. who kept saying that that was a yeah. bunch of bullshit on the yeah. TV. Yes, and he's all well dressed. He's decent. He's wearing a tuxedo, and he's like, "Everybody's a sellout, boys." And he's like, "I knew there was something special about you two. Yeah, pulls them in. They all look around, and he essentially tells. Uh, I'm using the word essentially too much. He, he takes them to the recording room where they start killing again. Yeah. <laughs> and they run into Holly. That guy teleports away. And he's like, come on, Holly. He brings Holly. Holly looks, looks she doesn't look scared at all. She looks no. like, what the hell's going on? Rowdy pulls her with him and he brings her to Frank. And then he goes to the roof. And he's, she pulls a gun on Frank. Boom. Frank's gone. And then... Best scene in the movie. R Rowdy Roddy Piper dies. Nada dies by disabling the satellite, which is what's sending out the signal that prevents us from seeing like the Obey or the aliens themselves. So it's officially confirmed Holly was a double agent. Right. She was working for the aliens all along, even though she was totally normal. She buys into their subliminal messaging and believes that the world is better that way. Takes every, you know Takes Frank out. But then Nada actually saves the day. And then all of the aliens across the world are now seen for who they truly are. Dude, that so one one's in a bar and he's just kind of like <clears throat> drinking there watching the TV. And everybody's looking at him. He's like, what? <laughs> Another one's uh, like having sex. The sex his, one is and his the funniest. His, that's, this is the ending scene. This girlfriend's like watching the TV and then he's looking at her. He's like, what's wrong, babe? It's, it's just... <laughs> Oh, man, it's so good. It's awkward and good. But, yeah, that, I mean, that's the movie, man. That's I'm kind of sad we, we were done talking about it. That's not... The climax at the end isn't as... Um, I don't know. It's not as big as, as I was building it up. I think it's one of the most meaningful climaxes in any of, the, any of the movies or any of John Carpenter's movies. We actually have something get done. And something has been broken. Doesn't mean humanity's saved. Probably far from it. But at this point, but it's going to wake up people. People have woken up and stay uh, woke. Yeah, they're they're aware of their surroundings. They're aware of the yeah. obeys. They're aware of the hey procreate. Stay asleep. They they want to control us. We're essentially. I feel like this is more of kind of a commentary on how the rich view us as their consumers they are in power and we are not <laughs> i really i mean i really like the way i agree with you i i really like the way that you think about it that's exactly how <clears throat> we as normal consumers feel that you know if if you're rich you're you're rich because of other people you know i would guarantee it almost all all of rich people were built off the backs of others in some yep. way shape or form um now, what you choose to do with that power or with that rich 
is up to you. And that's what, in my opinion, makes you a good person or not. Is that why you love Batman? No. I, I don't like Batman because he's a normal guy and doesn't have superpowers. But he's a philanthropist. He is, but... He's Bruce Wayne, man. He's also fake. I like to think of real day, real modern day Batman. Bruce Wayne's. Like the Elon Musk of the world. Or the, was it, Jeff Bezos of the world. He just pledged $10 billion to... What was it today? Um, we, we can get into Jeff Bezos, but I don't think I don't trust. I'm, I'm saying yeah. I'm saying those people, yeah. good or bad, are should be they should be ranked based off what they do for the world when right. they're that rich. Like I'm whether they're good or bad, in the housing crisis in San Fran, which I'm not going to solve anything, but it, it'll help out those who are employees at Apple who can't live there. Right. I, I think people with money have responsibilities, and they need to they need to be better in the world right period i don't care how good you are um if you don't make an impact on the world you could be the nicest guy you could be a family man you can be a millionaire but if all you're doing with that money is nothing and you're not contributing to helping the world um sustaining our climate um you know just just being out there and doing things that mean something um you're just you're not a good person still i guess now we can move on to trivia Yes. What do you got for me? Uh, the line, I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum, was ad lib. One of my favorite characters in, in video games growing up gets to use that line, and I always thought it was his line. I thought that yeah, I that was too. from the game. I but... did too. He, but his line was, I'm here to kick ass and chew bubblegum. I'm all out of gum. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great line. I'm glad he did that. Um, Rocky spent a lot of time practicing his acting. He wanted to be an actor, not a wrestler. Yeah. He fell into wrestling because that was kind of his family business. Mm. You know, it's something that he was raised to do in a way. And a lot of the interviews with him, he talks about how he, he worked really hard, especially during the filming of this movie. He worked with Frank, um, Frank's character, mm. a lot on like understanding how to act. And they both helped each other a lot in different ways, which was cool. Man, Keith David coming back for another movie from The Thing. He wrote Frank specifically for Keith David. One of the alien TV broadcasts refers to the director by name. He's complaining about sex and violence, and his dialogue breaks off with the words, Filmmakers like George A. Romero and John Carpenter have to show some restraint. They're simply dot dot dot. That's pretty cool. So a fun piece of commentary from the, the soundtrack or the commentary track of the movie? Yeah. Uh, Carpenter pointed out that Piper made has made more movies than John Carpenter has. And Piper says, um, or, or John says, I've only made 20 movies because he, he hasn't, you know, he's only made that many. Uh, but Piper says, yeah, but they're all 20 good ones. Like you, what you make is good. Yeah. We've, I've made more movies than you, but <laughs> it's quality over quantity kind of a thing, you know? He said that to John Carpenter. Yeah. Oh man. That's a nice thing to say to a friend. He's a good friend. So no, no. I thought Keith David did more movies with John Carpenter, he, but only he only did two. those two. Yeah, you know? and that was that was their final films together. Yeah, no, I you know, I want to see more more John Carpenter films. The uh, was it the the Halloween remake mm -hmm. or reboot was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Some things, if we, if we ever watch that, I have some complaints about it, but he's definitely a great... I thought it was a better sequel. You thought it was a better sequel? Yeah. I don't know. I haven't I haven't seen the second one in a long time. Well, we got time. Yeah. <laughs> we got nothing but time. Biggest flaw of this movie? Holly's character, in my opinion. I don't feel like she was even needed. I think they could have gotten rid of her. I think that that character didn't do much. Until the end of the movie, which you could have filled anybody in that role. Replace her as John, or as not as ex-wife. Way more Give meaningful. him a reason for him. He is wearing a wedding band for, throughout the entire film. Yeah. Like, he's he was a, he was married and he refused to take it off. But, yeah, just make a character his wife and have them fight. Add more connections in the film. Yeah, but then you get into a weird place where how do you fit that in with his uh, vagabond transient style living? You know, his, his wife kicked him out, and he couldn't... They do it with Keith? He was kind of lazy. Character. He wasn't pulling his life together. 
I mean, it's easy. It's an easy sell, but especially in '88, I think it would have meant something a bit more than having some woman he met that he put a, pointed a gun at betraying yeah. him. I agree. I agree. I think they could have fixed a lot of stuff. Good movie. Give it a. I would give it a seven out of ten. Worth watching at least once, just to think through. I feel that this movie has not aged very well. I feel like in some ways it has, but in a lot of ways it it doesn't live up to today. I feel like it's it's a beautiful cheesy eighties action film with some bits of horror. I can't even really call this horror. Just because there's aliens doesn't make it horror. Yeah. Well, we talked about this before, but this movie reminds me a lot of 1984, which I just finished reading um, a couple weeks ago. And a lot of the likenesses, the cameras, everything kind Mm -hmm. of being overseen, overseared by an elite class who will make, they want to control how you think and what you do and your procreation. Yeah. Very, I see a lot of similarities, especially with today. That's George Orwell, right? Mm Mm-hmm. We can get into War of the Worlds, too. We do that. That would be a fun one. They have mm-hmm. very um, similar stuff. Well, what have you been up to lately? What have you watched, read, or seen? I would say 1984. I'll stick with that one <laughs> nice. for now. It's a very good... Uh, I would say it's one of the best books ever written as far as discussion of when government control becomes too much. Uh, when the ruling class decide to kind of overtake, not not even the ruling class, but just controlling how people breathe, think, and live. And that's not a way to live life. So just, just be cautious and look at the sources of news you get and discern what's true, what's reality, and what's being spoon-fed to you as potentially a lie. So think about that. I like it. Well, mine isn't nearly as deep or serious, but I'm still hooked on that uh, ex-Marine Ghost Hunter book series. Um, I'm reading, I'm finishing up the second book right now. It's, What's the series called? So the 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 second book is called The Lighthouse. Mm-hmm. Um, supernatural Horror with Scary Ghosts in Haunted Houses. It's the Berkeley Street series written by Ron Ripley. Um but yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. He's he's a badass. And um, in this one, this adventure, he goes to an island uh, lighthouse that is being possessed by a woman named Dorothy mm. who wants to use the souls of scared victims to propel herself off the island and back into the mainland so she can haunt the mainland because she's currently stuck on the, the lighthouse island. So this ghost wants to leave an island so she can haunt more people. Yeah, and get more powerful. Because okay. the souls that she gets give her strength. Is That's the idea, at least. And uh, so, yeah, if she can propel herself into the mainland, then she can go on haunting and become more powerful and, and be able to do more, whatever that means in the afterlife. I'm confused. Like, how, how strong can she get? I don't know. Hopefully Shane can stop her. What if there was a ghost uh, on the mainland already that wanted to get more powerful? They would just be rival ga- uh, ghosts at that would, point. Would they be? Uh, would they be screwed? So yeah, I think the way I think the way it works is the the souls that she actively captures garnish her power, like they build up her power. Um, so if you're already dead and you're another soul, you're not yeah. useful to her. You're just hmm. a, you're just another ghost. But there's also like. It feels there's very levels to ghosts. Like their anger gives them more power. The more subtle they are or the less angry they are, the the weaker they are. Like her children that she murdered, they're ghosts that are trapped on the island, but they don't want to harm anybody. They just want to hide in the cellar. Yeah. So she killed her kids. Oh, she killed a lot of people. She killed her husband, her father, her kids. It's brutal, man. It's brutal. Vengeful spirit. She is a very vengeful. She did that alive. Anyways, that's what I'm reading lately. Having fun with. And as always, Dead by Daylight. Obviously. Back in the, I'm back in the uh, It's Fun Again stage. You're back in the saddle. Back in the saddle. I am in the uh, I Need a Break stage. Well, you don't get a break from me. Uh, that's true. That's true. And you know who else shouldn't take a break from us? Our wonderful listeners. Ooh. Please follow us. At the number two guys horror pod, 
That is the number two guys horror pod on Instagram and Twitter. Um, we are a lot more active on our social media lately. Um, just having a lot more fun. There's a really cool hashtag on Twitter that I've been joining in on called hashtag fright club. Um, every night they're watching a movie at 10 Eastern. It's usually on Amazon or Netflix. Um, and basically you watch along and you tweet out live as you're watching the movie and get to kind of have a conversation with other horror fanatics that are out there. So last night we watched a movie called Inhuman, Inhuman Kiss that was on Netflix. Oh, really? It's a Thai horror film and it was really good. It was mm. a lot of fun. Yeah, that sounds awesome, man. I'd be always be down for that. Uh, so also, if you guys have any feedback, if you'd like to actually be on the show, feel free to reach out to us at the word to TWO guys and some horror at gmail.com uh as always we appreciate all the listens we get from you guys we uh this is a labor of love for us and it's nice to see that uh people are appreciating it and we appreciate you too and we have a lot of fun doing it yeah of course (laughs) well thank you guys all for listening um and we'll see you guys next week adios wear the glasses (laughs) 